Well, are you guys ready for this morning? I love this Jacob series. Uh, it's been a great message every week, and uh, I hope that today will be the same. We're going to be talking about Jacob, a work in progress. Let's, let's recap. Let's take a few minutes and just recap, because we are going through the story of Jacob. So when we first got to know Jacob a little bit, it was him and his brother Esau. They were wrestling in the womb for who was going to come out first. And um, it turns out that Jacob's brother Esau emerges first. They're obviously, I think you can tell from what I'm saying, twins. And a few moments later, out comes Jacob. So we hear about this already. We, we encounter a story where Jacob and Esau, um, Jacob's a man kind of, of staying around the home, a chef kind of guy, and Esau's man of the country, and pretty soon we hear that the parents are developing favorites from this interaction, and Jacob becomes his mom's favorite, and um, becomes kind of a mama's boy, to be honest with you, and then Esau's man of the country, and a hunter, and so on. One day, Esau, quite hungry, comes in from the field, and and uh, Jacob, first time we kind of encounter, even though Jacob's name itself means heel grabber, which is a, an idiom for deceiver. Um, first time we really see this in live action when, when Jacob sort of takes advantage of his brother's hunger and uh, uses that to take his brother's, he's the oldest brother, take his brother's inheritance from him. Later we, we learn that um, Jacob's mother develops a plot to make sure that the inheritance falls into Jacob's hands. And Jacob ends up in this very elaborate ruse where he puts on animal skins because Esau is much hairier than Jacob who's smooth skinned and goes in and deceives his brother with his mom's great cooking he goes into his father and he says, hey, I'm Esau, bless me. And in fact, Isaac, who's quite old at that time, he can't see and can't very well uh, hear either apparently because he can't tell the difference between Jacob and Esau's uh, voice, ends up giving Jacob Esau's blessing, which if you recall, Pastor Dustin explained to us includes all the all the amazing blessings of being in the line of the Savior and and one day um, that family line now Jacob's not Esau's will give birth to the Messiah Jesus well this causes quite a rift in the family quite a rift between Jacob and Esau and he ends up booking it booking it out and running away from the family to save his own skin and on the way out, he stops at a place for the night named Bethel. Well, later he names it Bethel, the house of God. And there he sees this amazing dream where God is at the top of a stairway to heaven and is reassuring Jacob that in fact everything that has happened, while it didn't happen necessarily the way that God had intended to happen because there was a lot of deceit and sin involved. Nevertheless, God was going to use it as he always does to bring about his plan. And Jacob was part of that plan. And before we dive into today, I want to read you the words that were spoken by God to Jacob as he's leaving for the land of Paddan Aram, which is where the whole family originally came from. This is what he says. God says to him, There above it, that is this staircase, this stairway to heaven, stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east to the north and to the south, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's the promise of the Messiah, the Savior, and your offspring. I am with you 
God tells Jacob. Just reflect on those words for a second. Jacob's got to be feeling a little bit guilty at this point, a little bit realizing that, you know, he hopes maybe he can get back with his family and his brother Esau's anger will subside soon. We learn later on it takes 20 years. To hear those words from God, Jacob, despite your sin, despite your guilt, despite the things that you've done that you should, you, you well deserve to be ashamed of, in this. Instead of just trusting me, you took it in your own hands. To hear God say from the top of that staircase, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. Now there's a reason I recap all of this and and read those words for you because everything that we're going to be talking about it, that we are a work in progress this morning flows from those words that I just read. You get no progress without God's gracious promises to be with us, to protect us, and ultimately to bring us home to heaven. That's where we are today as much as Jacob was in his own day needing those promises that despite his sin and guilt, God would be with him because God is a gracious and merciful God. We need that. Now, having said that, once we've grasped hold of that, there's a process that goes on for the rest of our lives that involves us sinking ourselves deeper and deeper into those promises. Meaning we can hear those words, we can believe those words, we can trust that Jesus really is our Savior, that he is with us, that he will be with us wherever we go, and time and time and time again, because of the devil, the world, our own sinful flesh most of all, something's going to happen to us, many things are going to happen to us, and there will be a niggling doubt in the back of our mind, is God really with me? Does God really love me? Will he really forgive me for that sin? Will he truly be with me wherever I go? And when those doubts raise up, they do something else in us. They prevent us from leaning fully on God. When we talk about a work in progress, I want to define what we mean by progress. Progress in this context means leaning more and more and more fully on God's promises, on God's amazing love for us. And whenever we resist that, whenever we say, well, I better take care of this myself, we're going backwards. Progress is learning to lean into God and his promise more and more and more, knowing that he will never let us fall. And so we're a work in progress. What I mean by that is that's a constant daily work to trust God for his love and his promises that much. And it's constantly challenged. Is God really going to be faithful to us and catch us, be present with us? And that's why I want to talk to you today because the more we can lean into God's promises, another wonderful result happens. The more deeply you trust God and his faithful love to you, the more you're going to reflect in your own life, in your own heart, in your own words and actions, the Christ who is living in you and who is helping you lean into him. And so that's another part of the progress is that because we do trust God's faithful love, we begin to reflect that in how we treat one another and how we trust God. So with that said, you're gonna see an example here of that happening with Jacob, because Jacob's faith, remember, he's just heard these words, I'm with you, I'll be with you. That's about to be tested. So let's, um, let's dive in. Very first slide though is not gonna be Jacob, it's gonna be Paul reminding young pastor Timothy 
to remind us that this, is, this work in progress thing is not just Jacob that is a work in progress, but it's all of us because look at what Paul writes to Timothy in the New Testament, hundreds of years later. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your, fill that in for me, may see your what? Essentially, what, what Paul's telling this young pastor, Timothy, is it's important for us to be able to reflect progress to each other because then we spur one another on to progress. When you progress, and when I see your progress, it encourages me to progress in my faith, to lean more fully into God's love and promises, to reflect Christ's love through my words and actions. And so we all help each other. We're a team progressing together. Let's read the text. So we're in um, Genesis 29, beginning at 14b. After Jacob had stayed with him for a while, for a whole month, so Jacob's arrived, he's now ensconced in his family's house is what this means. And Jacob's relative, Laban, said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. So strange that Jacob should notice that, but apparently he did. <laughs> Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Which, as Laban's going to mention later, is totally out of order. That's not the way things are done. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. That's a beautiful line, isn't it? Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast, big party. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah, and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And, and Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, oops, not Rachel, there was Leah. Hmm, that's, that's going to be an issue. Um, when morning came, there was Leah, so Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Can you imagine that encounter? Like, just put yourself in that spot. I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you, you can circle that word in your notes if you've got it there. Why have you deceived me? That's going to be a theme of this whole thing. Constant deception. The deceiver has now been deceived. Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. Good negotiations there on Laban's part. He's got him locked in for another seven years. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife, Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel, you can sense some trouble coming here, can't you? His love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. Now I want to take you back. <laughs> Jacob has just been like completely separated from his family due to his own sin with some help from others, but due to his own sin that he has to take responsibility for. God's forgiven him, told him, I'll be with you. And in what seems like rather short order, although some years have passed, 
he's in trouble again. This time he's the one being deceived, but he's still got a lot of progress to do. Thus, the theme for today, we're a work in progress. And I want, I want you to hopefully agree with me that there is a, there's a great quote. We'll put it up here. Augustine said this, and I, I hope you will, you'll agree to, with me on this. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. See, if Jacob had remembered that, things might have turned out a little bit different. To seek him, the greatest adventure, and I can vouch to that. To find him the greatest human achievement. Now, as Lutheran people, we might blanch at that a little bit because we would say that's God's achievement. But there is a saying even amongst Lutherans that says faith is a work of God but an act of man. And I think that's what Augustine is saying here is that in our own action, there should be nothing that's a higher priority to us than that God be part of us, that we be in this relationship with God. It is all God's work that we believe in him. We will always believe that, confess that, and yet also it is important for us to say, if we turn our back on God, if we walk away from him, if we have no time for him, how does he, how does he find us? because we're stiff-arming him. And, and let me just say that that spiritual stiff-arm, God will ultimately, now he's, he is relentless in trying to portray to us his immense love. He will come after us and come after us and come after us. That's the comforting part of God's faithful love. And yet at some point, if we keep stiff-arming him, He'll respect that. And that's why we don't want to go through life not wanting to progress and not wanting to drop the stiff arm and instead embracing God as he first embraces us. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to tell you that there is one great workshop for this that God has given all of us that goes along with our text for today, and I love this workshop. A few weeks ago, I, I told you here at church, I showed some pictures of the, of the Bears training facility, and I said, in some ways, church is our, is our training to progress in our faith. And I don't know if you guys all realize this, but here at Amazing Love, we have a strength and conditioning set of coaches for your faith. Dan, you can raise your hand. Dan is the head strength and co uh, conditioning coach here at Amazing Love for our faith. We call him the discipleship director. Rick's over there. He's the assistant coach. We've got team members. I see Holly. Those are the discipleship team. They are here. Laura's part of that to help us grow stronger in our faith. And if you ever want to know, how can I develop my faith? How can I grow stronger in my faith here at Amazing Love? Talk to any one of those people. They are your coaches. But there, <laughs> did you know God's also given you a home gym for the strength and conditioning of your faith? Now, what, what would that home Jim look like here you can do this first fill in since we're already talking about it the workshop of progress let's go back and read again now Laban had two daughters the name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel Leah had weak eyes but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful Jacob was in love with Rachel and said I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger uh, daughter Rachel Do you see what that is, what the, how, how Jacob's going to get his work out? How, for that matter, Rachel and Leah are going to get their work out? Through this thing called marriage. That's why I'm so happy that we've got this, this um, 
testimonial coming up. And by the way, if I didn't say it clearly before, you are all invited to hear Kyle uh, and, and to, uh, to hear their, um, their testimonial later on. Because Meredith and Kyle have just this amazing testimonial of how God has led them in their life. And it'll be, as I said, back in the kitchen. Everyone's invited to that. Let's, let's take a look at this slide about the ultimate aim of marriage. This might be surprising to you. Let me stand in front of it for a second. Don't look back there. <laughs> Most of us get married because we're in love and we think we need a companion for our life. And that's the number one reason we get married is so that we can have this person to, to help us. And definitely that's a big reason we get married. Even in Genesis, it tells us that God brought Eve to Adam to be a help meet to him, right? But I think this is something we all need to remember. If the ultimate aim of marriage is Christ-like love, because we have to learn to forgive one another and love each other graciously and forgivingly and mercifully, that might be the aim, is to learn this Christ-like love with this person whom we're whom we're with every day, who sees all our ugly parts. Then he goes on and says his primary purpose is to make us more like Christ. Like the Christ who leaned fully on his heavenly Father's faithful love, right? In the garden, remember that, where he's like, Father, I don't know if I can do this. Are you present with me? As you said, you'd be present with Jacob. Are you going to help me? Are you going to support me? Are you going to strengthen me? How am I going to get through this cross, Father? And Jesus says, okay, not my will but yours be done. I'll lean on your faithful love. And then he walks through it with God's presence and power. Leave that up there for a while, because I hope everybody, maybe you write it down, maybe you memorize it while you're sitting there. Yes, marriage is about companionship and mutual love and supporting one another, but ultimately marriage is your home gym. To develop your faith, because you're gonna be challenged in marriage to love in ways that you simply can't. What are you saying? Yes, I'm saying that there are going to be times in your marriage where you're going to say, I just want to give up. I can't do this anymore. I am fed up with this person that at one point I loved so much I couldn't think of anything else or anyone else. It, God has given this beautiful thing, and, and that's exactly what's going to happen here. And throughout the whole Bible, we're kind of told that we need other people and we need especially this person that God has placed in our life and that also, by the way, we have to take some responsibility for choosing to marry. But throughout the Bible, take a look at this, this proverb. We, we sometimes laugh at this proverb. But I want you to think about it. It's actually pretty profound. A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. In other words, in marriage, if we're constantly quarreling with each other, it's not helpful to our faith. But look at what it says right after that. And you know, we often quote this among men. But honestly, I think the person that sharpens each of us the most is not, you know, a, a member of the same sex, but a, our spouse. We should be sh quoting this heavily in our marriages. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Let me tell you, I can, I can guarantee you from personal experience, that Julie has sharpened me many times over and that I would not be the man I am today without her. And that's what marriage does for you. Let's go on. 
The one who guards a fig tree will eat its fruit. This is a metaphor. What it's saying is we're meant to guard one another, protect one another, be there for one another, and whoever protects their master will be honored. As water reflects the faith, so one's life reflects the heart. That's the conclusion. If it's really true in a marriage that we can say we're better together, that's developing our heart. And our life will reflect the heart that we develop. Now let me just say quickly a few words to those who've gone through rough patches in their marriages, and we all have. But sometimes that even gets so bad, it's, it results in divorce. And, and this might not be our first rodeo with marriage. And we're struggling with this whole part because maybe we feel like we failed. Or our spouse failed. We tried as hard as we could, but you know what? They failed me. And that's a brutal feeling to pledge your life to another until death do us part, and then all of a sudden have that fall apart. And to be in this position where you're saying, well, well, now what? I, I almost feel like my marriage didn't sharpen my heart for God. It dulled my heart for God. And you do sometimes find that people get so frustrated and aggravated in their marriage that they leave church. And what I want to say to you is God's promises are still true for you. And if you will just persevere in him with his help, none of us can do that. Whether you are in a marriage that you would classify as 97% a happy marriage or 50-50, it's good some of the time, it's pretty bad some of the time, or or if you're, if you're saying to yourself, wow, I don't know how much longer I can survive this marriage, or I didn't survive that marriage, do not let that shake your faith in God's amazing and faithful love for you. Whichever stage you're in, God will be faithful to you. Look at what happened to Jacob. His family came apart at the seams because of his deceit. And what does God say to him on the way out? After he had just done things that broke apart his family, God said, brother, I'm still with you. I will watch over you. I will protect you. I will love you. I will forgive you. I will help you. So wherever you're at in that spectrum, that's still God's promise to you. And whatever Whatever has happened in your marriage, hopefully you're still seeing. This is and was God working on my heart. So will you write this down? Marriage is an ideal workshop for the Spirit's work in us. And that includes even if that marriage ends and breaks up. Because I guarantee you, if your eyes are open to the grace of God and to His power, you will learn things from that. Remember, the greatest romance is the one you have with God. All right, number two, let's talk about the test of progress. So let me tell you, and some of you have experienced this in marriage, some of you have experienced this in a business partnership. There is one thing I believe that is the hardest, most difficult, most challenging test of your ability to lean back into God's love and God's promises. So let's, let's talk about that. Put up the, the verses. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came... He took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Wow. How, what word would you use for this test? I, I would use the word, a man will reap what he sows. This, 
Remember Jacob's earlier story? Let's go to the Genesis, earlier Genesis, the 27. When Esau heard his father's words, this, now Esau comes into the room where, where Isaac has just blessed Jacob, and Jacob barely, by the skin of his teeth, makes the escape before Esau comes in. And his father says to Esau, says, how are you not, what? You're, Esau was just here. Who are you? He burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. But he, your brother came, Jacob, deceitfully and took your blessing. For, for those of you who've been in business or in a workplace and your partner ripped you off, embezzled money from the business, or you overheard the person in the next cubicle to yours backstabbing you and, and, and gossiping about you, or, or far, far worse, you were in a marriage thinking you were together and found out that your spouse was cheating on you. I, I'm going to tell you that will probably break you and God is going to have to put you back together again. And I'm telling you that because if any of these things have happened to you, you felt that brokenness in that moment. Maybe some of you are still feeling that brokenness, even as we're here today. And I, I'm telling you this because I, even though it's hard for me to say this, knowing that there are people listening to this and it's hurting their heart very bad, I'm telling you this because Kyle and Meredith's story, you should go listen to it and see what God did for them. And, and what I can stand here and assure you is that God will take your brokenness and, and turn it into something truly blessed and wonderful because that's what God does. He works with our brokenness. He helps us through our brokenness. He repairs our brokenness. You guys all know that shattered poetry technique that's used in Japan where they take broken pottery and then they weld it back together with gold. Have you ever heard of that? And the, and the vase that emerges from that broken pottery is even more beautiful than the original vase before it was broken. Yes, you can still see all the fault lines and the brokenness, but it's filled in with the gold. And for you, it's going to be filled in with the gold of God's presence and love, faithful love and grace and mercy. And he is going to strengthen you and make you useful. He's going to, he's going to take that and you will progress through it. I guarantee it because that's the kind of God that we have. In, in the book of James, James, the brother of Jesus, promises us that this will happen. Look, look at what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's where God is taking us through all this pain and hardship and brokenness. God is taking us to maturity and completeness so that we don't lack anything in regard to our faith. Here's what I want you to write down. There's no greater test of progress than being cheated. There just isn't. And that's what we see in this story of, of Jacob but we also see God's mercy and grace and how he's going to help us through our tests. Let's do the third and final part. The tough but important truth about progress. Luther says this. I think I've even used this quote with you before, but it's so important. 
A Christian is never in a state of completion, but always in a process of becoming. In other words, there's never a time. This, this is the tough truth, all right? I'll get to the important truth in just a second. The tough truth is you're never done. And sometimes that feels discouraging to people to go, when's my faith going to be done? And I'll be so deeply rooted and, and producing so much fruit for God that I'll be able to just kind of take it easy for a little while and let days slide by knowing that I've got this really deeply rooted, strong faith producing so much fruit to the glory of God. I, I can stop my devotions and my prayers and just, you know, do other fun stuff. And the answer to that is never. Because we're, as Luther says, never in a state of completion, but always, always in a process of becoming. And we see that in our story. Jacob, so seven years later, he works seven more years. Jacob finally gets Rachel, and now he's got Leah, and he's got Rachel, and he's got the two servants, Zilpah and Bilhah. And we read this, Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. Here's the point. I don't know what possessed Jacob to agree to this arrangement, but he should never have done it. How he was treated by Laban was definitely wrong, but Laban's proposed solution was wronger than wrong. And yet Jacob agrees to it, and there's going to be nothing but challenge and trouble that emerges from this very damaging arrangement. And I'm amazed sometimes, even our own world, this is how this applies to us whether in our marriages or our jobs uh, or in our relationships with our, our neighbors or our friends, that we think that we can take a problem and solve it with an even bigger problem. And yet we often do this. And, and talk about deceit. We deceive ourselves first to think, well, here's a problem. And it needs a solution, so I'm going to take this very broken, stupid, foolish solution and apply it to my problem and go, that's going to work. No, it won't. It won't work at all. It'll just eventually make things worse. It might build a facade over it for a little while, but that's what's going to happen here. And what we're going to see is Jacob's got very disordered love. And that disordered love is going to affect everything about his future life. And that means right there in that little short phrase, he's still a work in progress. Much as he's heard these amazing promises of God, and I know he trusts them. So we're talking about a person that is a believer. And I'm talking to you who are Christians and believers, and I'm encouraging you not to, to solve brokenness with more brokenness. To, to solve issues with other <laughs> sinful issues. But it, that's why we repent. We try to turn around and come back to God and get in the state of leaning into him. And sometimes that requires us to wait. And that's hard. But here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to notice is while we can't ever, due to our own brokenness, apply the gold to ourselves as the vase, we're just the broken vase. Even Paul says, we're broken vessels, all of us. There is one who can apply the gold. And if we want to get to a state of maturity and deeper roots and producing more fruit, it's always going to be him. It's always going to be fully and completely him. It's a work of God, our faith. Yes, we should be obedient in our action, but we can never really take 
credit for that action because it's his spirit working on our hearts. Take a, take a look at this, this um, passage from Colossians. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. How do we get to completion and maturity? Only in Christ. He is the head over every power and authority, and he is the only one that can glue us back together and help us make progress in our faith and in our life. Here's what I want you to write down. The need for progress is never diminished except in Christ. And anything other than trusting that, that, that he is the one who brings progress in the end, he is the one who completes us. I know Renee Zellweger said it in the movie, you complete me. But truly, we can only say that to Jesus. Jesus, you are the one who completes me. And all the other things that, that come apart from my relationship with you, that, that's frosting, that's gravy. That's peanut butter and jelly. Because Jesus... You are the one who completes and perfects and, and brings us ultimately to our progress. Luther has one more quote I want to finish with. He says, don't buy into any other explanation because any other explanation is just sin. The sin underneath all our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ. It's a lie and that we must take matters into our own hands. That will take you into all kinds of places you don't want to go. Just leave it in the hands of God. Trust Him. He will complete and perfect and mature you. He will grow your roots deep, and He will produce fruit in you that you can't even imagine. Here's your next step. I will place myself under God's loving leadership so he can help me progress in my faith and in my life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be here, to be reminded that hearing your promises and even coming to faith and trusting you is not the end. We're in a long-term process. We're never done, Father. And sometimes that feels exhausting to us. Sometimes we just want to throw up our hands. Lord, sometimes that happens in your key training ground, our marriages. Lord, work with us to keep on trying and keep on going and to, and to see what marriage really is. It is our opportunity to be perfected in our ability to love others as you have first loved us. Father in heaven, we thank you that even though our faith is often tested. Oh, and it's brutal when it's tested through people practicing deceitful things on us and cheating us. There's nothing more tough, Lord, but you are still with us. Your promises still apply to us. Your love is still faithful to us. Help us to trust that and know you as the faithful God, the amazing love God that you are. Jesus, you are our perfection. You are our finishing. And that's why you said those words on the cross, which very much apply to each of us. It is finished. And Jesus, in you, one day, I will be finished. Thank you for that. And we pray in the name of Jesus. I also want to lift up a, a special prayer today. There's a young man, Daniel Kohler, who was tragically killed in a car accident recently, and uh, we want to pray for his family. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace and mercy on this family. I'm sure right now they are experiencing their own level of hurt and pain 
and grief and brokenness. It is never easy to watch a young person die in a car accident and to know that there is a family that dearly, dearly cared about and loved him and that that family now is going through deep challenges. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on them, remind them of your gracious promises, of your faithful love, and of the fact that there is a resurrection, as we sang earlier. There is victory over death because of your victory, Jesus, over death. Help us, despite the pain that we've been through in life, to always, always, always live in hope. And we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus, who taught us to pray these words. No, go to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now, before we leave, just to be reminded of how great and how faithful our God is, let's go back to that Apostles' Creed that you put up there a second ago. Let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.